In this lecture, I'm going to provide an overview of some of the medical nutrition therapy considerations for diabetes. So your textbook and the other materials in the learning unit this week are going to provide more detail. So what I want to do is just sort of give an overview of diabetes and some considerations when you're thinking about medical nutrition therapy and hopefully kind of guide your uh, reading as you read the other materials that are posted in your textbook and look at the other resources available. So let's start with some definitions, just a little bit what diabetes is. So really in general, um, and I think diabetes is one of those things, everybody's heard something about diabetes and knows a little bit, but really in general, diabetes happens when for whatever reason, the sugar can't get adequately and efficiently from the blood into the cells. So we remember that our cells are where um, our, our body needs the sugar to do the work. We need a small amount in our blood, but really that's just um, a vehicle, for lack of a better word. So when it can't get into the cells adequately and efficiently and get cleared out of the blood, then diabetes develops. So there's different types of diabetes. Uh, type 1 sometimes used to be called juvenile onset because it was often seen in children. Um, it, it still is, but it's not only in children, and type 2 can also be seen in children. Uh, but type 2 is essentially, or excuse me, type 1 is essentially when the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. So in type 1 diabetes, the uh, someone who has that must be taking insulin because their body does not produce anywhere near enough um, perhaps almost none. Type 1 diabetes can be caused by a variety of factors, somewhat not always known exactly what causes type 1 diabetes, but it could be um, sometimes a virus, sometimes a, a very much unknown. Often it's detected early in life, so, so it is typical for type 1 to be detected in uh, childhood, and usually because there is that absence of insulin, it'll be detected when the blood sugar goes very uncontrolled very high, dangerously high, then that's often what leads to the diagnosis. Type 1 diabetes is much less common. So that's about 5 to 10 percent of the cases of diabetes in the U.S. So we'll spend a lot of time actually looking at type 2 diabetes because that's often what you'll see more of. I mean, it's 90 to 95 percent of the cases. And particularly as you are kind of in entry-level practice roles. Uh, typically type 2 is what you're going to see a lot more of, where type 1 um, often you're seeing when you have a little bit more practice uh, with that. So with type 2 diabetes, it's not that the body doesn't produce any insulin, but it's that that insulin is not working efficiently. So basically, there's insulin present and often actually high levels of insulin, you know, abnormally high, because the body's kind of trying to compensate for the fact that it, it recognizes that there's not enough sugar in the cells. So it's pumping out extra insulin to try and get that sugar into the cells but the cells are insulin resistant, meaning that the insulin is present, but it just isn't working well. So that's kind of the cornerstone of type 2 diabetes is that insulin resistance. Now over time, sometimes um, the, the pancreas keeps producing so much insulin to try and compensate that essentially it fatigues and then the person does start producing not enough insulin and sometimes people on type 2 diabetes can can be on insulin injections, but that's much later in the disease progression compared to type 1 diabetes. So that's type 1 and type 2. Uh, the other type listed here is gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes is uh, those abnormal blood glucose levels that are detected for the first time during pregnancy. So this is different than a patient who has type 1 or type 2 diabetes and becomes pregnant. This is someone who never had diabetes before, but during pregnancy they get into a situation that their body cannot control the blood sugar and it goes to that uh, point of being diagnosed as diabetes. Most often it goes away after pregnancy, but not always, and it does put that person at risk of developing type 2 later. Prediabetes is, is not technically a type of diabetes, but it's a state where the body isn't um, it's not it's not handling the blood sugar adequately, but it's not quite to the point that the blood sugars are elevated to meet the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. 
Prediabetes has gotten a lot more recognition because it's basically the early stage of a disease that is progressive. So we know diabetes is a progressive disease. And if we can help people catch it early, hopefully we can slow down or, and or prevent that progression. And then I put other, because there is a lot of active research with diabetes, whether maybe there's some, some types of diabetes that don't fit into exactly these definitions. Uh, we won't go into that, but just recognizing sometimes there are situations that it, that isn't a really necessarily a clean fit. But in general, these are the types of diabetes. Again, remembering type 1 is absolute insulin inefficiency, insufficiency, uh, where type 2 is really starts with that insulin resistance um, and is the much more common type of diabetes. So then we look a little bit at risk factors for type 2 diabetes. And I'm going to fix my typo right while I'm here. <laughs> Um, excuse me, risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Um, obesity is one risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Typically when our fat cells get large, they become more resistant to insulin working. And so that's really what's thought to be the primary reason that obesity is a risk factor, although there's probably other metabolic things going on there as well. A family history of type 2 diabetes, so it does seem to have a, a genetic susceptibility component. A personal history of gestational diabetes, so as I mentioned, if a woman had gestational diabetes, she is at higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Also, if someone has had a large baby, and sometimes that can be due to undiagnosed gestational diabetes, um, but that is a risk factor. Physical inactivity is a risk factor. Impaired glucose tolerance or that prediabetes, as I just mentioned, is not uncommon that that progresses then to diabetes. And then there are some higher risk ethnic groups, which of course is an, an uncontrollable risk factor, but important to know that it's, it's more common in some ethnic groups. So in terms of the problems with diabetes, there's really both uh, acute complications as well as chronic complications or long-term. So in the short term are things that are kind of that immediate when blood sugar gets high, what kinds of things happen there? And then the long-term is, is over time when we have continually high blood sugars. So we need to think about how the person with diabetes is going to manage both of these. So in terms of acute complications, this is going to be things like um, uh, hyperglycemia, or which is just elevated blood sugar. So anytime that blood sugar is high, um, that's hyperglycemia. Often people will feel uh, thirsty, they'll urinate a lot, um, sometimes feel fatigued, because essentially there's the, the sugar is remaining in the blood rather than getting into the cells. So the fatigue is that the cells don't have the sugar to do the work. The thirst is that the body is basically senses that that amount of sugar in the blood is too high and is trying to dilute it out, really. And then that causes uh, increased urination as well. Uh, so that's one of those short-term complications, potentially ketoacidosis. So if the blood sugars get really too high, um, it disrupts the acid-base balance in our body and can cause uh, ketoacidosis. Hypoglycemia may be uh, an acute complication if the person's on medication that would cause that, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, later. And then the long-term complications, and this is what often we're really, I mean, we need to prevent the short-term complications as well, but really looking at the potential long-term complications and minimizing the risk to that for those. So when the blood sugar is high, it really causes damage to the blood vessels, and that's both the small and the large blood vessels. So diabetes is a big risk factor for cardiovascular disease because if blood sugars are running high, it's going to, again, damage those large blood vessels, um, putting someone at risk for cardiovascular disease. It also can damage the blood vessels in the kidneys. So it um, puts the person at risk for um, for um, damage to the kidneys, nephropathy, or nephropathy, um, and then also damage to nerves, uh, which is neuropathy, uh, damage to the blood vessels in the eyes, retinopathy. So basically it's looking at small and large blood vessels and damage to those. So the kidneys, the eyes, the nerves, and the cardiovascular system are really where we see that play out. Diabetes, I believe, is still the biggest um, risk factor for kidney failure. So this is something we really want to help people control those blood sugars to prevent the long-term complications. Now, 
the complications again come because the blood sugar is high. So it's not just the fact that has someone has diabetes, but it's how well that's controlled. So that's what we really want to help people see and help them be able to uh, manage those blood sugars to prevent those long-term complications. So things sometimes you hear about amputations with diabetes, things like that. That's typically because the, of the nerve damage and often it happens like in the feet. And so the nerves are damaged. The person doesn't have as much feeling there and they may get, for example, a, a sore on their foot that they just don't even realize it gets infected um, and that can get really bad and cause amputation. So lots of things that can be um, can be really bad, but can be preventable with good blood sugar control. So then let's look at how diabetes is diagnosed. So these standards I pulled directly from the 2017 Diabetes Standards of Care, which is posted also with your materials in your learning unit. Um, I will tell you those standards of care are, are extremely long. There's a lot there, but some really key pieces of, infor of information that can be pulled. So essentially there are a few different ways that diabetes can be um, diagnosed. Uh, fasting plasma glucose, so that's the FPG, of greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter. So basically that's fasting when they haven't eaten anything for at least eight hours, that if the blood sugar is that high, that would be diagnostic of diabetes. Another way to do it is with an oral glucose tolerance test, and so that's what that o OGTT uh, is there. In um, the oral glucose tolerance test basically gives someone a uh, load of glucose um, and then tests what the blood sugar would be like after that. So that next diagnostic criteria would be that two-hour um, post glucose after giving this oral uh, glucose tolerance load or this load of glucose and looking for tolerance to that. So if that's above 200. Now, sometimes um, I know when I was working on diabetes, people would say, well, of course my blood sugar is going to be high. They just gave me all this sugar. But the reality is if our bodies are functioning normally, it should be able to clear that amount of sugar in that amount of time or get it below that 200. So that's another way to diagnose. The third way listed on this slide here is A1C, which stands for hemoglobin A1C or glycated hemoglobin. Essentially what that is, is looking at um, uh, sugar attached to hemoglobin. So it kind of gives us a picture of what the blood sugar has been like for about the past three months. So this hemoglobin A1C is a really critical lab value to become familiar with in terms of diabetes because it's used not only for diagnosis, but for monitoring. And it kind of gives a little bit of a more longer term picture than just a single blood glucose level. So for diagnostic purposes, that A1C above 6.5% can diagnose someone as uh, having diabetes. And then there's one more piece um, on here in patients with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia or hy hyperglycemic crisis. So basically something is really clear that they seem to be running periodically um, high in their blood sugars, a random plasma glucose above 200. And random pl plasma glucose just means it um, has no regard to when the person ate last or what kind of sugar or what kind of food or whatever, just a random time to check that. So these are the diagnostic criteria. We'll also look in a minute about uh, typical blood sugar goals. So these are numbers that, that you want to be familiar with because these are targets that patients are going to have to work with. So let's shift now to looking at kind of at um, the management of uh, diabetes and prediabetes. So again, prediabetes isn't actually diabetes, but I think it's important to recognize because people are starting to uh, be referred to dietitians for uh, management if they're picked up in this stage. And it's always a great time to see people because they, it, it's just starting and hopefully the things that we can help them work on can really prevent progression to diabetes or substantially delay it. So really the focus is on lifestyle changes, looking at increasing physical activity. That increased physical activity does a variety of things. Uh, one, it use, you know, uses calories. Sometimes it results in weight loss. It also makes the um, cells more sensitive to the activity of insulin, so it improves insulin sensitivity in the cells. It also sort of upregulates the transport of the transporters that transport glucose into the cells. So lots of benefits of physical activity independent of weight loss. And I think that's important for patients to know that it's not just that 
physical activity helps lose weight and burns calories. It's all these other metabolic things that happen that are beneficial for uh, blood sugar management. Moderate weight loss, um, even a small amount of weight loss, like a five to 10% weight loss for a lot of people can help improve those glucose levels. Education, so just helping the patient learn um, the, the types of things that, that affect blood sugar levels, the types of things they can do to reduce their risk of that disease progressing, et cetera. Uh, reducing fat and energy intake to help with weight loss, um, following them regularly, emphasizing whole grains, fiber, basically kind of a well-rounded, healthy diet is what we want to look at there that's balanced in calories uh, and balanced in nutrients and then working that physical activity in. When we shift to looking to actual diabetes and when someone's actually diagnosed with diabetes, I think it's important that you recognize all the aspects of care that go into taking care of someone with diabetes in addition to the piece that you will be providing for them. So nutrition certainly is a key element of diabetes care because of course we know that the food that goes in is broken down and turns into sugar to some extent and has to be metabolized. And when someone has diabetes, they have a disruption in that metabolism. So we need to help them with that. So nutrition is really a key element. But the other, um, elements on the slide here are equally as important. So physical activity, I just mentioned that a bit with prediabetes and is the same is true for diabetes. Now a couple of things with physical activity um, we'll look at briefly is that um, for some people, particularly if they're on insulin, et cetera, they may have to adjust that a little bit based on their activity level, but we want people being active. Uh, medication. Initially with type 2 diabetes, sometimes people start with only changing diet and physical activity and are able to manage their blood sugars that way. Many patients will need medication and or they may manage with diet and exercise for a period of time and then have to go on medication and very often patients will eventually then have to go on more than one medication. I think it is absolutely important that we never give the patient the impression that it's quote unquote their fault that they have to go to medication or that they did something wrong. Um, unfortunately, diabetes is a progressive disease. And we've talked about that there's some things to hopefully help slow that progression, um, but it is progressive. And so patients, you know, we want them to do the best they can, but it doesn't mean that they failed if they have to go on medication. So it's really important that we let them know that and we don't somehow give the impression that they just didn't do good enough and that's why they're getting medication. Um, self-management education. So the self-management education has to do with nutrition. It has to do with physical activity. It has to do with monitoring medications. It has to do with blood sugar control. It has to do with looking at foot care. It has to do with how they schedule their physician appointments, all of those things that patients need to be educated on how to manage their disease. Usually a nurse or a diabetes educator will do that self-management education. Sometimes dietitians are also diabetes educators. Sometimes nurses are diabetes educators. There's a variety of disciplines that can be diabetes educators, but they would look at kind of that uh, more uh, global aspect of diabetes care. And then this piece that says monitoring is basically looking at how the uh, patient is following up with their physician, is watching their um, blood sugar tracking, is getting their labs checked regularly. And that also includes uh, blood lipid levels because diabetes is such a risk factor for cardiovascular disease it's important that patients are monitoring their risk for that as well. So just kind of that ongoing monitoring. So all of these elements are really important. Your focus as a dietitian obviously is on the nutrition aspect of it, but you want to have a, a, an idea of the other aspects. So if the, if the patient has, is having issues with that or is having questions, not that you have to be able to answer all of those, but you know where to point them to get those answers and that you can also help support and reinforce the information that other providers have given them. So those are kind of um, a variety of factors. And now we'll shift a little bit more specifically into, um, well, we'll look, I guess, a little bit first at various factors that affect blood glucose and glycemic control and how 
tightly. We want to control the blood sugars and then specific nutrition factors. So it's important to recognize that it's not only food that affects blood glucose levels. Um, certainly food is a big aspect, but exercise also affects it as we just kind of talked about. Hormones also do. So there's the hormones that norm, you know, we normally think about like glucagon and insulin that regulate blood sugar, but there's also a variety of other hormones like cortisol and epinephrine and growth hormone that can affect blood sugar. So that's why sometimes, for example, during pregnancy, or if someone, a child is going through a growth spurt or those types of things that can cause blood sugars to do things that, that they don't normally do. Um, illness, fever, those types of things can affect blood glucose levels as well as medications. So obviously diabetes medications are intended to affect blood glucose levels, but sometimes other medications can affect blood glucose levels. So important to, to recognize that it's not only food. So glycemic goals basically means what do we want their blood sugar levels to be? And again, this comes from the 2017 Diabetes Standards of Care. These are, um, and I kind of want, want to highlight this and make sure to point this out, uh, recommendations for many non-pregnant adults with diabetes. So I point that out because one, non-pregnant goals in pregnancy are different and many, because this isn't necessarily everybody. So um, the patient's physician or endocrinologist will help determine what their individual goals should be. So you don't necessarily need to set that, that would be the physician really helping with that. But it's important for you to know what, what kind of typical guidelines are um, and to, to be able to support, you know, helping get them to those target goals. There's a variety of reasons why patients might need, might be recommended to have a tighter goal, meaning tight means that it's closer to the what a non-diabetic blood sugar range would be, or for them to have a little bit looser or less stringent guideline um, because of various reasons, usually that we don't want to risk uh, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. So in general, um, a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%, uh, preprandial capillary plasma glucose, so preprandial uh, before a meal, somewhere in that um, 80 to 130 range, and then peak postprandial, uh, less than 180. So that's postprandial is after a meal. Um, and typically that peak where your blood sugar peaks after a meal is about one to two hours after. So that's usually when you would look at that uh, postprandial. So if a patient has, for example, blood sugar logs that they bring into you or that you have them keep, it's important to know, was this a fasting? Was this a, a you know, a pre-meal? Was this a, a postprandial? What was it in order to, you know, decide if that level is within the range or not. So this is kind of the default if there's not another specified goal. This next image also comes from the uh, 2017 Diabetes Standards of Care. You don't have to know any details of this, but what I thought this was kind of a nice illustration of kind of this idea that um, <clears throat> how tightly patients, um, how tight of control is recommended for patients varies um, depending on other situations. So kind of this A1C of seven that we just said is sort of the standard. So more stringent, meaning tighter control, closer to normal blood sugar levels, less stringent, meaning we're, we're okay if their blood sugar is a little bit higher. So these would be kind of some reasons that we might, or that a physician might, um, or diabetes educator, um, recommend uh, tighter or looser goals. So for example, um, I guess just one, life expectancy. If we are talking about a 30 year old person, they're going to live a lot longer. And so they have a lot of time to develop those long-term complications. So we would like to keep their blood sugars, you know, maybe tighter control. If the life, you know, if we're talking about an 85 year old person, their life expectancy isn't all that much longer. So we certainly want to prevent those acute complications, but there's not as much time to develop those chronic complications. So those are the types of things that a provider would think about, you know, how tightly we'll want to control this uh, person. 
The other uh, big factor is that risk of hypoglycemia. So if someone is really at high risk for having a low blood sugar, we don't want them kind of staying on the, the low end of the guidelines. Probably we want them maybe a little higher to prevent having a hypoglycemic, a severe hypoglycemic episode. So just again, just more of a visual that I thought kind of helped highlight uh, why we would, you know, why more or less tighter or looser control would be recommended. Okay, now let's shift to some of the specific medical nutrition therapy. I am going to go over again, just more kind of highlight big picture and then the readings and the other materials in the learning unit will give you some of the more details. So some general considerations. We wanna think about macronutrient distribution. So remember that means how, what percentage of carbohydrate, protein, fat, we're looking at recommending for this individual. So we often think about sugars or carbohydrates as being kind of the quote unquote bad guy with diabetes, but also remember that the patient is at risk of cardiovascular disease. So we also want to be cognizant of fat. Um, so typically macronutrient distribution, I would say often looking somewhere in the range of 50% of calories from carbs, uh, maybe 30, 35% from fat, um, and the remainder from protein. So somewhere in that ballpark is a typical uh, macronutrient distribution. They can go lower. Some people need to maybe go down to 40% of carbs, um, but we don't want a super low carbohydrate diet because that's going to tend to not be an overall healthy diet and is probably going to start to get up in the fat content and particularly saturated fat. Often when people get really low in carbs, if they're eating meat, proteins, that fat and saturated fat tends to get high. Um, sugars. So people are, you know, we think of sugar a lot with diabetes. They can have some sugar. It's just a small quantity. So there's some, a piece in, you know, there's some in your book and in the learning unit on carb counting and things like that. So for the most part, um, sugars and like a processed sugar like sweet is going to affect blood sugar fairly similarly to uh, a little bit more complex of a carbohydrate. The thing is when we eat sugars, it's so concentrated that it's a very tiny amount of sugar that has the same amount of carbohydrate as say, you know, an apple or something like that. Like you get a lot more volume in the less processed carbohydrates. So it's not that there's no sugar allowed at all. It's just that it can add up pretty quickly. So that's why it's really something to watch for. I noted overall diet quality on here because I think it's really, really important when we're educating patients with diabetes and helping them learn about nutrition and diabetes that we also help them see it's not just about minimizing the sugar intake or keeping the fat low or you know whatever. We also want to see them having an overall good diet quality. We want those important nutrients that are protective for their heart and all of those types of things. Sometimes I think patients um, and, and perhaps, you know, professionals feed into this as well, but get so focused on uh, reducing the carbs or reducing the fat or all of those things that we forget about. We still want the diet to be a very healthy diet. That's also why we don't want a really super low carbohydrate diet, because then we're missing out on those valuable nutrients that are found in carbohydrate foods like fruits and whole grains and um, beans and things like that. So those are kind of some general nutrition considerations when you think about medical nutrition therapy. Then in terms of some more detailed, one thing is there is no one quote unquote diabetic diet. We really need to individualize it. We need to really assess where the person is at in terms of uh, their motivation, their interest, what kind of support systems they have, what other kinds of health issues, what their metabolic pattern looks like. So what, how high are their blood sugars? What are the blood lipids look like? Are there other metabolic type things going on? What's their weight status? What's their blood pressure? All of those things we need to think about and lots of other considerations. So really thinking what, what seems like it's most likely to work for this individual person. Some options um, in terms, or you can kind of do something between this, but I would say these are kind of the uh, major, uh, standard options. We can do something that's a structured meal plan. So there used to be, what used to be very popular was uh, diabetes exchange lists. 
And those have really kind of gone by the wayside, although I have, well, I don't know that they've totally gone by the wayside, but to some extent, but I have some information on those in the learning unit, because I think even if you don't use it quite the way it was originally intended, it's very helpful information to know because it helps you be able to sort of quickly um, make a meal plan or give guidance that's about the right calorie level, the balance of carbohydrate, protein, fat, and that sort of thing. So one option would be to have a very structured meal plan. Some people like that. Some people like very details. Just tell me what I should eat for breakfast and lunch and dinner, at least while they're getting started, and then hopefully having them branch out from that, that they can build it a little bit. So that's one option. Carbohydrate, and so in the structured meal plan, you would plan out, you would kind of take, for example, how many uh, calories, estimated calories they need in a day, then you would break it down based on your macronutrient distribution. So if you wanted 50% of car uh, calories from carbohydrate, then you'd figure out um, how many servings of carbohydrate foods, et cetera, et cetera, and do that structured meal plan. And we'll do a little work with that in class. Um, carbohydrate counting basically puts the focus on the carbohydrates. Now, protein and fat, um, particularly protein, can also have some impact on blood sugar, but it's typically not nearly as much impact as carbohydrates. So carbohydrate counting can kind of keep it simple, um, simpler sometimes, and it really focuses on what's going to probably have the most significant impact. So essentially, um, carbohydrate counting looks at whether food has carbohydrate or doesn't, and those serving sizes and counts it that way. Again, in the learning unit, there will be some more detail on carb counting. And then the plate method is kind of a more rough estimate of sort of sort of like my plate, that sort of thing, but about how much of your plate should be filled with um, vegetables and a carbohydrate food, a protein food, those sorts of things. So it's a very visual, it's very simple, um, and sometimes that's helpful for people who just need something simple to get started or whose blood sugars aren't really that terrible, we're at a starting place, and they just need a little bit of tweaking. Um, sometimes that can be helpful. Something I didn't mention here, uh, frequency of eating is a huge factor. So it's really important that patients realize that they need to be eating um, relatively frequently through the day. And typically about every four hours or so works. It's not that they have to be nibbling, nor would I advocate that they are nibbling and snacking and grazing all day long. Um, but essentially their body is not able to handle a huge sort of dose of food at one time, if you want to think of it that way. So it needs it in smaller amounts um, to be able to process that. So really making sure people are having a regular eating pattern. Typically three meals and a snack uh, works for most people. So sometimes that's the really the first goal. If someone's only eating once or twice a day, the first step might be just to get them to where they're eating more frequently. So then there's kind of some specific nutrients or compounds in food that people often have questions about or, or looking at how this affects blood sugar control. So fiber is one. We know that fiber is the carbohydrate source that our bodies can't fully break down. So fiber doesn't contribute to the rise in blood sugar as much as other nutrients because our body can't fully utilize it. Typically high fiber foods also have some other form of carbohydrate, but in general, uh, the fiber is going to be, again, less absorbed and have a little bit less impact on blood sugar. Artificial sweeteners um, are, are not typically going to affect uh, blood sugar levels. So if, as long as they don't have any type of sugar, if they're a non-nutritive sweetener, meaning they don't have calories in them. Now, there are certainly other you know, concerns people might have about artificial sweeteners, but in terms strictly of blood sugar, looking at whether it affects blood sugar, it doesn't. Um, alcohol is one to be a little bit careful about. A few things with alcohol, one is it obviously contributes calories. So if someone is trying to reduce calories, sometimes that can be counterproductive. But alcohol can actually make blood sugar go down rather than blood sugar go up uh, because it's metabolized in the liver. And while the liver is metabolizing that, it's not releasing sugar into the blood, that sort of thing. And so it actually can, can cause people's blood sugar to go down. So just important if someone's consuming alcohol that they're careful with their blood sugar monitoring, especially as they're kind of learning how their body reacts to that. And then vitamin and mineral supplements. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but in general, um, sort of standard vitamins and mineral recommendations. 
there's not a lot in terms of uh, specifics, um, and I'm kind of hesitant because I think there's um, there's some evidence to support, you know, perhaps there's some a slightly different vitamin and mineral uh, needs in patients with diabetes, but there's not standard routine different recommendations for vitamin and mineral supplementation. We talked about physical activity being a key part of lifestyle recommendations for the treatment of diabetes. As I mentioned, for those using insulin or insulin secretagogues, which basically is a, a, a medication that stimulates your pancreas to re, re, um, secrete more insulin, they may need to adjust their food or medication so that they don't get hypoglycemic, so a low blood sugar. So typically an extra 15 grams of carbohydrate for about every 30 to 60 minutes of activity um, and really probably not a need to adjust for activity less than um, 30 minutes. The next piece I want to touch on is medications. I am not going to go through all the medications because I think there are good resources in your book and in the readings I posted on uh, the different medications. But what I want to do is highlight a few things that as you're going through that material, you really focus on. So one thing you want to look at with medications is their mechanism of action. So we have, I mean, we talked about insulin, um, but there's then there's a variety of oral medications. So those oral medications, some of them act on the pancreas to help the pancreas secrete more insulin. Some of them act on the GI tract to, to sort of um, affect the absorption of the carbohydrates. Some of them act on uh, the cells to help them be more uh, receptive to the insulin working. So we need to think about what that mechanism mechanism of action is. That's something to be familiar with. Another really key piece of uh, information to know about a medication is whether it has a risk of hypoglycemia. So some medications do and some do not. The reason that's important for you to know as a dietitian is if they're on a medication that has a risk of hypoglycemia, you definitely need to give them instruction on treating hypoglycemia. So the general rule of thumb, if someone has a hypoglycemic episode, if their blood sugar is low, when they test, they should have 15 grams of a um, carbohydrate source, a simple carbohydrate source, so like juice or something like that. Um, and I didn't put it on the slide, I'm just going to write it here because this is an important thing. So 15 grams of a simple carbohydrate and then wait about 15 minutes, so CHO carbohydrate, wait about 15 minutes and test their blood sugar. And if it is coming up, then they can have a balanced snack that includes some protein and some carbohydrates so that they don't just drop back down again because we've just given a very simple sugar so it's not going to hold for long. If it is not coming back up, do another 15 grams and check in another 15 minutes. So kind of the 15-15 rule for that treatment of hypoglycemia. So again, if someone's on a medication that has the potential to cause hypoglycemia, you want to talk to them about treatment of that. Another thing to be looking at in medications is the onset, the peak, and the duration of the effect of medication. So you really see this a lot with the insulins in particular. You want to know when that's going to start working, when the maximum, you know, the peak effect is going to be, and how long it's going to uh, have, be in effect, because that can affect um, when they're, you know, when they're eating with that. So ideally, uh, typically, um, and again, this specifically pertains to insulin, um, they're going to be eating kind of when that uh, is peaking or we need to have food present when that's peaking. And then the frequency of dosing. So are they taking, if it's an oral medication, for example, are they taking it twice a day? Are they taking it once a day? Are they taking it at night? Are they taking it in the morning? When has that been recommended? And then um, with insulin, people are on, there's all different types of insulin. So that's something I want you to look through the materials in your book and the reading materials um, for those different types of insulin and when they're used. Some insulins last most of 24 hours. I mean, theoretically 24 hours, it doesn't always last everybody quite that long. Some of them are intended to cover just the meal they're eating, that sort of thing. So you want to know that because that affects your nutrition care plan and how you're educating that patient to eat along with their medications. So those are just some things I want you to note as you're reading through and looking at the medication material. The last piece I want to touch on uh, relates to insulin to carbohydrate ratio. So if a patient is on insulin, they may be 
dosing their insulin based on their carbohydrate intake. So if typically they'll be on an insulin that's like a basal insulin, so it's going to kind of cover sort of the normal ups and downs through the day that our bodies kind of go through, but then they'll be on an insulin that's a short acting insulin that covers the meal that they're eating. So essentially they can look at the food, if they're on this kind of a plan, they can look at the food they're about to eat, count the grams of carbohydrates, and then dose their insulin based on that, give their insulin and eat, because by the time the insulin gets in and hits, the food will be in as well. So the ratio, a typical ratio is about one unit of, uh, unit of insulin for every 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrate. Typically the doctor or the diabetes educator will tell you what their ratio should be. So again, at kind of an entry level, you wouldn't be expected to be determining that ratio, but you would need to know how to use that ratio to educate them. So then you would be teaching them to very accurately count the amount of carbohydrates because if they miscount, they may give too much or too little insulin, which could cause them to be uh, either hyper or hypoglycemic after they eat. So um, if someone's doing this, it's really, really important that they know how to accurately count carbohydrates. And usually they'll get that training and be able to kind of demonstrate that they're doing that before they really move into doing that in a very um, tightly controlled way at least. So in summary, uh, nutrition is a really key component of treatment. Diabetes is one of those areas that the information that you have to provide and to be able to really work with patients to help it meet their needs and work for them is really critical and it can really help them uh, prevent complications and keep those blood sugars as close to normal as possible. You also need to be familiar with other aspects of care. So it's not that you're doing those other things, but it's important to recognize all the other pieces that go into the management of diabetes and know who's on your team that if a patient's meeting with you and they have questions that are really out of your scope, that you know who to refer them to and make sure that they you know, get the resources they need. Your nutrition therapy really needs to consider that individual patient's needs and medications they're on and, and a host of other things, but really focusing on um, their individual situation. It's not a one-size-fits-all sort of thing. And regular monitoring and follow-up care is really important. Um, patients aren't going to get it all in one visit, typically. Typically, they need multiple education sessions and life changes, things change, and so they'll need that follow-up care on an ongoing basis so you can help them adjust their food and nutrition and eating patterns and eating, you know, whatever um, they're doing to, you know, how their life is changing, how their diabetes is changing, how their blood glucose levels are changing. The, um, that monitoring and regular monitoring, the more data you have, so if, when the patient comes in, if they can bring their blood sugar logs, those types of things, that will really, really help you tease out what's going on and help help you be able to make recommendations to the patient or work with them to make adjustments in the places that don't seem to be working as well for them.